So all it started, in fact, uh, in the March 2011, the same patient had got the more or less similar symptoms that time. And in between from 2011 to 2014, he visited five doctors, 15 doctors, five Ayurvedic physicians, and four homeopathic physicians. He had to do ultrasonography of abdomen nine times, CCT abdomen three times, MRI abdomen once, and also he was hospitalized for six times during this whole course of three years. But when he came, I saw all the reports and I checked him. Then it is obvious to me that it is a case of the irritable bowel syndrome. It often happens because I will discuss later on how I, it takes so much of time to diagnose a case of irritable bowel syndrome. The point is, this from 2011 to 2014, this gentleman had a long journey as an IBS patient. And during this journey, actually what happens to him that he lost all his agricultural land. He lost the quality of life. He lost his appendix. He lost his gallbladder. That is the problem with more or less of the patients with IBS. In fact, in reality, I am quoting this slide again. The most of the time, the incidence of surgery, abdominal surgery or gynecological surgery is also more often seen with the patients with IBS. So that's why it is a very pertinent approach what we should do when we see a patient with IBS, how we should approach this particular patient. So when I was in the University of Virginia, long back, almost 1999, Fabio Comilani, he was my professor. He was the director of the gastroenterology department in the university. So during our discussion, weekly discussion on different subjects, so I asked that particular day, it was the discussion on IBS, I asked him, what is your approach when you have to see a patient with IBS? So Fabio immediately, he, he told me that off the record, Dr. Gusami, I would love to look at the exit door. I don't want to see the patient because I have to avoid it. The point is the reality. You have to be honest to take a unique approach with your heart and the head to deal with the patient with IBS. That, is, that was the message given to me by my professor. Yes, you have to bring the art of medicine to be added to the science of medical, uh, uh, medical knowledge. So this, in fact, it is a reality because the IBS basically it is a problem both mentally and physically for the patient. And it is definitely a very, uh, a very difficult presenting a real challenge for the diagnosis for the doctor and also to deal with the patient. So IBS simply, if we describe it, it is an intermittent abdominal cramps and the constipation with alternating uh, period of the diarrhea. That is what the simple way to describe IBS. But the latest Rome classification, Rome Foundation actually, they always review the cases of functional bowel disease. All functional bowel disease, they define, they give the picture, they also give the guidelines. And that is what their, the definition in, 19, uh, in 2016. It is the abdominal pain one day per week for last three months, along with two or maybe three, the pain related with, with the defecation, the associated sense in the stool form, and also there may be associated 
the stool frequency. That is the changing and it must be for three months and which starts for last six months. That is the definition. And again, we should remember that the subtypes also we have got with the IBS, depending upon the stool formation. Here we can see the type one, type two, what usually we call it as the constipation. Type six and type seven, it is the diarrhea. That is what we call the diarrhea. And in between it is a mixed one. That is what the picture goes on. The IBS C, IBS diarrhea D, and also IBSM, the mix one with the, the. Here is the real fact. What we have got almost 40% patients, they report that intolerable abdominal pain. And 60% of the IBS patients, they plan their day-to-day -day activity depending upon the anticipated use of the bathroom facilities nearby. It's very important and you can imagine what is the quality of life for them. And 53% of them always, they accept that their quality of life is very much limited one due to the problem of IBS. This picture also clearly shows the IBS patient has got the pain reporting very often. It's eight if you o'clock. compare with the patients with, without the IBS. What is the pathophysiology? Basically, it is a complex pathophysiology. So many times, so many years, we are working on it, but it is not coming up perfectly. But all the thing till today, what we have got, you have got the gut, probably there is a gut and brain axis. And also there is some hypothesis, what we can see that the, uh, the brain gut axis. So different way it is ultimately mediated from the intestine to the brain and from the brain it gives the signal to the intestine and somehow the factors like psychological factors, environmental factors, food, then antibiotic use, then genetic factors, all these factors work together to give rise to the irritable bowel syndrome. And also we cannot forget about the stress and the IBS. It is very much interrelated. And whenever there is a high stress, it works as ultimately ends up with the IBS. And whenever there is more and more IBS symptoms, the patient has got stress. It is just like a vicious cycle. You can imagine from these particular slides, I can just quote from here, the child who gets a stomach ache when it is time to go to the school. Yes, we used to see the patients like this. The student who has to rush to the toilet just before an exam. The young wife whose abdomen swells and hurts whenever her mother-in-law comes to stay with them. So all this ultimately demonstrate the fact that the gut reacts to, to the stress. And if you see the whole pathophysiology, there is an evolution. Earlier in 1960s, we thought that it is a brain gut axis, then motility disorder, then visceral hypersensitivity, then neurotransmitter abnormalities. And now more or less we are coming to the altered gut flora. I'll discuss more in the next slide. The molecular studies now have revealed so many things new to the world. And basically it is a new world of gut microbiology. And of course, almost 80% of the bacteria are non-culturable because today in trillions, we have got the microbiome inside the intestine. And we do not know actually what is their practice going on. The old world, we had the simple microscope and found some few dots. We had a limited capacity to know about it. But today with the new world, we have got the new technology, but we can see the millions or billions of the microbe inside the intestine. We don't know who is talking who. We don't know what are they talking about, who is making what, and also, is it important? 
still the time is going on and working on it. So here lies some new facts coming up. So some people they see that after some enter infection, gastroenteritis or any other infection in the GI tract, following that the patient have some symptoms of the IBS. So that's why the new terminology coming up, these subsets of the patients as post infectious IBS. After the infection, it is coming. That's what the definition. It is a type of the IBS that is caused by the viral infections or a bacterial infection or a parasitic infection. And now we have got the more logic and more information on it. For example, almost one in 10 patients, they have got the his past history of the enteric infection. And the IBS patients themselves in the prospective studies also they are showing that almost three to 36% of the, them, they give the history of past enteric infection. Probably this post infectious IBS is an incomplete resolution of the immune response that leads to the persistence of the inflammations of the bowel and that facilitating the activation and the sensitization of the pain sensing nerves of the intestine. Also, although we do not know exact pathophysiologic characteristics of this new, the uh, new uh, group of patients, there is ongoing intestinal inflammation, there is intest uh, motility alteration, there is intestinal permeability also, also is altered. Probably that's how we get the more and more IBS symptoms in this group of patients. Here we have got the intestine after the infection, we get the IBS symptoms probably again, the gut brain axis is there. But these are the some factors involved here. The adverse life events, the depression, hypochondriasm. Then we have got the less than 60 years of age, female sex, smoking. All these factors work together towards the development of IBS symptoms. So basic pathophysiology, I'm not going in details. It is an accelerated gut transit. It is an increase in the rectal sensitivity. It is an increase intestinal permeability. It is increase enterochromaffin cells of the colon and also the increased number of the lymphocytes, they work together. Now coming to the symptoms, what symptoms we see in patients with IBS? All of you probably know about it. You see a lot of patients with IBS. It is more or less similar. Either they have got the abdominal pain, they have got the altered bowel habit, and also the bloating and a distension. Of course, we can see a lot of other symptoms as well, maybe sometimes intestinal, sometimes body symptoms, but always we used to get, it is chaotic. It is sometimes normal. It is sometimes the constipation. It is sometimes diarrhea. And sometimes the both the extremes you can see in the same patient. So that's why it is very difficult. Not only the symptoms do vary between the patient. You cannot see the exact picture in all the patients with IBS, of course, yes. But also same patient may have the different picture in the same day itself. That is the problem with IBS. You can see from these slides, all types of symptoms, as you can imagine, will be described by your patient with the irritable body even. What I used to call them irritable mind with irritable body, that is what the irritable bowel syndrome. Of course, we cannot forget about or we cannot ignore about some psychological symptoms like depression, somatization, the anxiety, hostility, phobia. So all these symptoms are also included and always we should look into it because almost 50% of this presentation ultimately can show that yes, there is a chance of a psychiatric diagnosis in this group of patients. So always we should take care of the history or the presentation 
so that we can get the exact diagnosis. Because diagnosis is important. Earlier we thought that it is a diagnosis of the exclusion. But diagnosis is a problem in IBS. Why it is the problem? Because his, here we have got these facts. Almost 70% of the patients have got the symptoms for more than a year. Then only they used to go to a physician. More than 10% of the symptoms, they have got more than 10 years before they get the diagnosis. Then we have got almost 25% patients with either the constipation or the diarrhea predominant IBS, the diagnosed almost more than five years after their symptom onset. And also 75% of the people with IBS remain undiagnosed. So this is the problem and that's why on the average to sum up, it takes to almost four years to diagnose a patient with IBS. That's why I initially told why that patient was almost four years uh, who came to me, who I described in the beginning slide. What are the barriers? Why you don't get the diagnosis of IBS? This is the barrier. Because the disease barrier, most of the time, the overlap symptoms are there. And no precise biomarkers we have got. And also there is heterogeneity of the symptom. Then also clinician barrier. We have got also problem because most of the time we do not have the proper perception of the IBS disease. Then also we have got the insufficient knowledge to use for the diagnosis of the IBS. We have to accept it. And finally, patient barrier is also there, what I have already just mentioned, the relaxation for them to go to a physician. And also sometimes they themselves ask about some unnecessary tests which may not be required at all. But anyway, we have to ultimately come to a diagnosis that is not what we thought earlier, that it is a diagnosis of exclusion better. Today, we have to come to a ultimately a, a positive diagnosis, concrete diagnosis, that is important one. The confident diagnosis is important because the reassurance of the patient, patient can understand now that I have got IBS, I will accept it. Then we can also avoid the unnecessary investigations <coughs> what happened to that particular patient. And also we can avoid the un <coughs> sorry, unwanted surgery of this patient. The diagnosis, always we should give importance to the clinical history, physical examination, and or at the same time, the psychological assessment, why it is important, it is obvious. <coughs> Sorry. The physical examination is important because it gives the trust with the doctor. If you touch, see, you can see the patient, <coughs> you can rule out most of the things. And more than that, the patient will see himself that somebody is giving some care to the patient. A single simple algorithm for the diagnosis, what we should be, <coughs> sorry. Always the assess the symptoms of the patient. You ask the patient about the pain, you ask about the bowel habit, and you can ultimately come towards the diagnosis. Always rule out the alarm symptom, that is the important one, whether the patient has got loss of weight, bleeding per annum, if there is any other symptoms which to cure the, uh, to rule out any structural problem. <coughs> and if the patient has got the new symptoms coming up after the years, 50 years, so that is another important point. And if the alarm symptoms are there, you evaluate the further for the diagnostic testing. You have to test thoroughly to get the final, uh, say what you have. And if it is not, then with the minimal testing you can do and go for 
is management. So what are the testing or the investigations about the IPS? This is very important one always. First of all, you should ask yourself, is it necessary? Then when it is necessary one, or up to how much, what extent we should go for the investigation. It is not that uh, unlimited you go on investigating one after another like that particular patient. We should be very clear cut that no test is required in the patients who is very young age. There is a typical history of the, the IBS and also if there is a relationship with the stress, anxiety, depression of the patient. You simply go for the treatment to the patient. But if there is some alarm symptoms, what we discussed just now, in those cases, probably we'll need uh, some diagnosis test. Like do we need an endoscopy and colonoscopy? This is another issue because very frequently <clears throat> the patient sometimes demand, sometimes we do unnecessary the test of endoscopy and colonoscopy. If we just think of ourselves, think the patient needs a doctor, he not an endoscopist. So in that way, it is important one, but some cases where there is alarm symptoms, we have to go for the investigation. This is the colonoscopy of a simple patient and the colon is very clean, clear, no problem with the blood vessels, mucosal membrane, and everything is fine. But see with this patient, again, the patient of one of my uh, IBS who came to present to me with the loose motion. And this is what the picture shows, the multiple ulcerations as well as the pseudo polyps <coughs> of the colon. Then again, this is another picture where we can see the clear ulcerations, erosions, and narrow band imaging clearly shows the picture very, very uh, clearly so that we can get the diagnosis and we should take the biopsy in the case of uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. And sometimes the patient presented with this one. When we did the colonoscopy, you can see the thousands of the uh, worms inside the uh, colon itself. So that's how also patient can present as the uh, IBS symptoms, but sometimes we require to go for investigation. <clears throat> now coming to the management, what should we do in these patients with the irritable bowel syndrome? Uh, the approaches by the physician that positively affect the treatment outcome, that is important one. Why it is important? Because the patient should acknowledge the disease. So first of all, the doctor should acknowledge the disease. You accept it and you tell the patient about details about the IBS. And then only the patient can understand that yes, he has got the IBS. The education to the patient, even the attendants are very crucial. Then only they can understand their problem. And also you reassure the patient that it is not a serious problem. There is no mortality with the IBS. So then only it will be easy for the patient as well as easy for the doctor. And that's why I always give importance to the therapeutic alliance of the doctor with the patient. That alliance can help not only the patient, it can help you as well. So we have got the holistic approach, non-pharmacological, pharmacological. In non-pharmacological, we have got diet, the lifestyle and behavioral changes and pharmacological, we have got the, some medications, but I will simplify what we should do. <clears throat> I told you earlier that it is the abdominal pain it is the altered bowel habit and the bloating and distension. That is what the symptom complex of IBS. And our whole aim should target the symptom. That's what the simple way how to deal with the patient. Then about the diet and the lifestyle consideration. Some years back, 
we have started that there should be low FODMAP diet for IBS patient. This FODMAP diet means highly fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and oleols. But the point is, I'm showing the slide. In the left side, we have got the high fermentable uh, oligosaccharide, monosaccharide, and disaccharide. And the right side, it is a low food map diet, food, food uh, fruits and all. So these are the two pictures I am showing. And initially it was thought that low food map diet are very much helpful for the patients with IBS. Yes, still we believe on that. But the recent studies again, they are showing that maybe it is not very much helpful, but we do not have any IBS diet, typical IBS diet. So that's why I always ask the patient to take their own diet, which does not aggravate their symptom. That is what I personally believe on. Then basically it is the symptomatic therapy, what I have mentioned. We need the antispasmodic, laxative, antidiarrheal, anti-anxiety, and sometimes probiotic sebin may be used. Antispasmodic, whole <clears throat> details I'm not going, whole list are there. Sometimes whenever necessary, if there is pain, you use it. Antiterial agents, again, the list I am giving. Again, in constipated patients with IBS, you use these laxatives. And also what I have already mentioned about the, the psychological issues related with IBS, that's why the tricyclic antidepressant like imipramine, decipramine, alprazolam, also liberally we can use it and it may be helpful one. Coming to another issue about the probi <clears throat> probiotics, because nowadays there are a lot of discussion. I have also given the picture of the microbiome and probably it can be helpful one in some cases of the irritable bowel syndrome, because this is the mechanism, mainly the interactions of the microbiome there is mucosal conditioning and also it is supposed to increase the immune modulation of the GI tract. Then there is the question of the antibiotic. Earlier, sometimes it was said that yes, antibiotic can be used, it may be helpful one, yes, because it can change the host intestinal microflora. But again, it is still very highly controversial. So probably better to avoid it. In some cases only you can use it. Rifaximin is another gut specific antibiotic, minimally absorbed, and we can use it with some evidence we have got. And recently there are some studies going on on the fecal microbiota transplantation in IBS. The new evidence for the success, still it is in the early stage, probably it will take some more time. But coming towards the end of my the discussion, the most important point, what I used to give stress to the physician and patient relationship. That is very critical one in the treatment of IBS. So this is what the slide shows clearly. And usually the IBS patient, they used to visit a physician very frequently if you compare with the patients without the IBS symptom. But at the same time, the relationship of the physician, the strength of the physician-patient relationship, it actually ultimately gives the hints how far you are successful. If the strength is not very good, then the patient will come to you once and again and again. But if the strength is good, you have got a very good relation, you have already have got a therapeutic alliance with the patient, patient trust you, then he's coming down very, not frequently, but sometimes only he will come back to you or he will go to some other doctor. That is the important point in my message to all of our doctors. Be sympathetic to the patient. What is the take home message from me is listen to them actively and over some empathy. It is not that he is a psychological issue and he should be angry or he should be disturbed. That is the first point. 
then always try to make a positive diagnosis what i have already mentioned don't provide premature and unrealistic assurance don't tell them that yes you will be completely cured it is not cured but we have to make them very effective and we should encourage increase their quality of life then educate the patient about the ibs and reassure them that is most crucial and the relationship with the patient is critical in the management of irritable bowel syndrome with this i thank all of you for your kind attention thank you